The Bible says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the rearward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually. And blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the rearward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times, only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that the priests blew with the trumpets. Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, and any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourself accursed when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the, police, when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman." and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had, and they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. And he shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn. And in the youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So Joshua, or so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout the country. And so at the beginning of this chapter, we find, obviously right after Joshua's interaction with the captain of the host of the Lord, giving him there his charge, essentially saying, are you with me, Joshua? And Joshua having to humble himself, standing on the same holy ground that Moses had stood in before and perhaps even Abraham experienced there in the presence of God. The battle for Jericho is about to begin in that same vein. Are you with me, the Lord says. Are you with me? Now when we get to Joshua chapter 6, the Bible says here of Jericho, in verse 1, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So here's a case of a siege. A siege in, in, in warfare is when the offensive army comes to the defensive city or base or, or whatever it is, the, the stronghold, and basically encamps around about it, ensuring that there is a guard set, ensuring that there is perhaps walls built, ensuring that none of that city can go out or come in. Straightly shut up is what is being described here, like a sealed lid on a jar. None go out, none come in. This is not a good thing to a city. And verse 2 iterates that. This is essentially a state of sheer defeat for Jericho. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Fully defeated is the king and his mighty men. So you can presume that also the people would fall. In a state of siege... It's not long before the food begins to dwindle. Before morale begins to fall among the defensive, among those that are shut up inside. You're going to find frustration built up within. You're going to find panic. You're going to find claustrophobia, perhaps. you got to think people were used to going in and out of the city all the time. Think of your own city. You're used to going in, going out, coming when you want to go. I don't know if you've ever been in a case where you essentially felt trapped within a city, but it's a fearful thing. I remember I used to live in Toronto, down near beaches. Um, moved away, of course, and then spent some time after getting married in Woodstock, and then uh, eventually Stratford, and then Kitchener, kind of gradually building myself up to bigger and bigger what would be called cities. But somewhere when I was still in Woodstock, I had to come down to downtown Toronto, right near the uh, train station, Union Station there. Hadn't been there for a long time. I'd lived there before. I'd lived in Hamilton before. Shouldn't have been a big deal. But I get down here about quarter after four, do my business down at that sky rise, and I come out, and it was just like a wall of vehicles. And in that moment, I felt besieged. It was, a, it was a fearful thing for me, having not been in the city much for a few years and having grown accustomed to having space and, and being able to freely come and go as I please and, and having fresh air, it seemed. And that moment I came out and I was just, whoa, uh, just completely taken by, by frustration, by, by panic even, by claustrophobia. If I wanted to right now get out of the city, I can't. These cars aren't even moving. And that was kind of the, the, the moment I realized I need to, I need to be done with cities. <laughs> and so that's why it was such a, it's a funny, ironic thing, because my wife and I had had that conversation. We did the city thing. We're done with it. It was a funny thing when we began to feel the impression and the call of God upon us to come and serve in Toronto. We thought that was some sort of sick joke from the Lord. <laughs> but, uh, but here we are nonetheless, and we're enjoying ourselves. <clears throat> but... That state of being in siege is 
what I wanted to illustrate there. Not being able to go in or go out. It can destroy a city before the city is even destroyed. No food. In the case of the Bible, we find when there was a siege that took place, it's not long before people start looking at the family pet as a little tasty snack. It's not long before, and you'll find in some of the major prophets and scriptures there, people start looking at their children, wondering if that one wouldn't be a tasty snack. And that's, uh, that's, that's the case of history. You'll find that scores and scores of times where people have resorted to cannibalizing their own families in order to stay alive in a siege situation. And so not only was Jericho previously discouraged, remember Rahab reported unto the spies that, that there, was, there was no strength left in the people. All the people had a, a heart that melted. They fainted. There was no spirit left at all in them as God's people inch closer and closer. But now God's people are surrounding them. And so you got to think that they had essentially given up all hope. And so God clearly could declare, look, see, the king has been given to your hand. All these mighty men have been given to your hand. And I love that key word there, given, because that's exactly what God promised. You'll simply march into this land and I will give you the cities. I will give you the, the, the villages. I will give you the, the, the forests. I will give you the fields. I'll give you the healthy waters to consume. All you have to do is follow me. Obey the voice of the Lord. <clears throat> so it's not a good thing when a siege takes place. And just, just as an aside, and I'm not going to spend, of course, the whole sermon on this, but <clears throat> right now in Alberta, if you're following, that, that, um, that church that I've been in prayer for, the pastor that was imprisoned, was then released, and then a weekend later... Um, now, the, the health department has extended the long arm of the Ontario, or the, not the, uh, not the OPP, the RCMP, to actually engage in a siege of the church building. No one would follow the rules for lockdown. They wore masks. They, they, they worshipped and gathered openly. But the interesting thing about this is that it's causing great frustration to the powers that be. It's also causing great embarrassment to the powers that be. Here we have a church, a big church, a massive church that is meeting without restrictions and yet having no cases for months and months and months and months. And they have no desire to change. I haven't followed up with what's going on there now, but they've been locked out of their building. And this has to be embarrassing to the powers of be, so they shut them out of their building. Of course, this is a little bit different type of siege where instead of entrapping the, the, the people in, the government is trapping the people out. <clears throat> but regardless, we, we see that same thing taking place. And that, that's a big whoopsie from them, I believe. These believers not locked inside, but rather we have now the world surrounding them but I started to think to myself, they didn't siege, because what they did was they set up these siege walls outside of the church building. First an inner wall that covered the actual building, and then an outer wall which covered the property. And they've got armed guards all over the place, um, jackboot police officers with, uh, with, with sidearms guarding the place. But now the believer's on the outside. And to me, it's like they've taken over the camp, and now the believer's on the outside. My first thinking would be like, hey, let's give this a shot. Let's march around this building one time a day <laughs> for six days. And on the seventh day, let's, let's get some ram's horns and blow a trumpet and see if God won't bring our, that building to the ground. We'll collect insurance money. It'll be all good. And the police's uh, desire will be, will be thwarted. Because <clears throat> I think some of these police officers are eventually going to want to go home. But nonetheless, I think they're, they're dealing with it graciously. Um, there's no violence. There's no strife. But it's not right. <clears throat> the thing I noticed, though, is that Christians don't fight like the world fights. And in all this, that's exactly what I've seen. People are expecting, because all of the media are bringing guards to protect them, the mainstream media, of course, and their police officers, of course, all heavily armed, and there's many of them, 
And they're expecting that these believers would show up and want to start something, which is why they even set up the fences, which is why they put two layers of these fences in these armed guards. But Christians don't fight that way. Christians fight by faith and following God and the voice of God in obedience. Jesus even said in John chapter 18, he said, he said if, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight for me. It's not of this world, which is why they're standing down. Of course, he had to reel in Peter a little bit. But they stood down as Jesus humbly went to the cross, went to pay for the sin debt of the whole world. Now, you can keep your finger there. In Joshua 6, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 first, for a moment. <clears throat> I think even in the context of this chapter, we find believers fight battles very differently. <clears throat> Where typically a siege would take place, like I said, the army would show up, set up a wall around about, a permanent structure, and then they would wait out the enemy that's on the inside, on the defensive, until they suffered long enough or, 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 or were weak enough that they could encroach on them and make their attack. There would be little offenses that would take place at different walls so they could gauge sort of the scenario. Sometimes the defensive people on the inside of the wall would start to um, take shots in the outside so perhaps they could find a breach in the, in the enemies that's, that's coming upon them, a, a breach in their armor. There had to be these little battles and, and, and things taking place. And this is fresh in my mind because I just watched a, uh, I just watched a little documentary on the, um, the, the siege of the rebellion in uh, Jerusalem that took place in, in 70 AD. Um, but God's people fight different. Joshua wasn't commanded to set up a wall. Rather, he was commanded to compass it with their own feet as, as they walked about. And I think there probably would have been enough people to, to get a pretty good spread on the land as they walked around. Maybe they, they spread out enough, some walking a little bit faster and at the front of the pack, some a little bit slower maybe. But the rear word was, of course, supposed to be the uh, ark, which would have slowed the pace a bit. So I'm thinking as people walk, they might spread around and there might be a human wall around about the whole place. Nevertheless, it's a little bit differently. And, and the Bible records that even of us as Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. There's a clear statement. We do walk in the flesh. We have this body. We have this frame. We have this, this, this treasure in earthen vessels. And that treasure in earthen vessels is actually the Spirit of God dwelling in us, which allows us to then fulfill the second part of that verse, we do not war after the flesh. We war in the Spirit. We've been given spiritual power to war. And that's what verse 4 says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's, that verse was truly fulfilled in what we saw in Joshua chapter 6. Now, there's a bigger context to uh, 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to ignore that for the moment. But that parenthesis there is, is for the purpose of explaining a principle that applies to all scenarios of Christian life with respect to verse 3. Okay, Because if you look, verse 3 says, We do not war after the flesh. And then verse 5 if you were to take that parentheses out, which, which is totally okay by English because you're continuing on in the thought, it's just the writer added something there, a little aside thought, a little, a, little, um, a little addendum, I guess, to the text. He says, casting down imaginations in every high thing. So this is, this is a spiritual battle of the mind that's being referred to here. And of course, it applies with what's being discussed in chapter 4, or in verse 4. It says, our weapons are not carnal. But our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Through God and through His Spirit, we're able to pull down strongholds. And back in Joshua chapter 6, we can go there. There's a good verse there in 2 Corinthians. You can go and memorize that one, a good one to remind yourselves of. The battleground for the Christian, of course, is in our minds and in our hearts. So casting down imaginations, which usually create doubt, which usually create... Um, 
uh, carnal thoughts that are just anti-scripture. Um, we need to cast those things down. The Bible says bring them into captivity of Christ. But in the context of Joshua 6, the exact same thing took place. The weapons were not carnal, though there were armed men. They never used them in bringing down the strongholds. The strongholds, physical here, were brought down. And I understand Corinthians is talking about spiritual strongholds. Um, but Joshua chapter 6 serves as a physical, actual representation of what we can do when we're warring in the spirit in the New Testament. And were we to be involved in a carnal battle under the leadership of God, I think it would look something like Joshua chapter 6. You see how the two ideas are the same? In our battle of the mind and over the lusts of our flesh, eyes, pride of life, we need to cast down those imaginations by the power of the Spirit, not using weapons that are physical. Here in Joshua chapter 6, there is a wall that will only be cast down through that same spiritual power. And that spiritual power here really comes to them when they're in obedience to God. Another great picture. So were we to be in a physical fight, here's what it would look like in Joshua chapter 6. And as we walk through it, you can take some of these things and bring them into spiritual application. Look with me in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 3. The command is given. It says, And ye shall compass the city. So there it is, just like a wall, compassing the city, all ye men of war. And go around about the city once, thus shall ye do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And so, to this point, there's been no weapon of warfare raised, but simply a mighty through God pulling down of the stronghold that is promised. Now, we find some types and pictures here. If you could, you could go to second or first Thessalonians, first Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. And when I'm reading a passage like Joshua chapter six, I mean the uh, the the little words here that are contained in it just start making little light bulbs go off all over the place. He said the, tr the word trumpet. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, he said there's going to be the people shouting with a great shout. And at the end, he said, the people shall ascend up every man before him. And that's after the wall of that city, that stronghold falls to the ground. First Thessalonians 4 Look in chapter 15. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So that means we're not going to go before them which are asleep. Talking about if you're alive and you remain unto the coming of Jesus, you're not going before those that are asleep or those that have already uh, left this earthly body. Verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he's saying that those that are asleep are the dead in Christ that shall rise first. Those that are alive and remain at that coming, what's going to happen and transpire at that coming? There's going to be the Lord himself descending with a shout, the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And he says, then, in verse 17, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so Joshua gives us a really nice 
picture and a carnal example, a parable, if you will, of what's going to transpire at the events taking place in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4 does give us really good insight about the actual um, events that transpire at the coming of the Lord, seeing that the Lord descends and he gathers together, um, he catches up together them which are um, alive and remain in the clouds. We meet the Lord in the air, ever being with the Lord. Of course, those that are in Christ and already dead in Christ shall rise first and meet the Lord in the air in the same way. And so we find out some really good details about that coming of the Lord, about that catching together, about that gathering together of us unto him. But the most important thing there is what it says in verse 18. And this is why the apostle is writing that. He says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Primarily, he's talking about, like it says in verse 13, we ought not be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. We ought not sorrow as others which have no hope, but we ought to look forward to the hope that we will one day be united with those that have died in Christ. And that's the primary application to this passage. Whether people want to debate the finer points of timings and of events that transpire, that's fine and that's all good. And people have varying viewpoints on what happens and when this happens. The bottom line is we see that it will happen. There is a coming of our Lord. There is those that are dead in Christ that will be gathered together, caught up together along with those that are alive and remain at that time And we'll all be united, and we'll all be with the Lord forever, and that ought to bring us great comfort and great joy. The picture, and you can go back to Joshua chapter 6, is plain. There's a trumpet sounding. There's a shout. And once that shout takes place, that wall of the city falls. That, That thing that was keeping them out of their goal, keeping them out of the promised land, out of the promised victory, Once that falls flat, once the weapons of our warfare that are spiritual and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and our weapons are the word of God and also prayer and faith that we back it up with, once that falls, then the Bible says, the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And so there we see a very good parallel. And you can probably write 1 Thessalonians 4, about 15 through 18 right there next to Joshua chapter 6 and verse uh, 5 and other places. And, and you can go back and forth and kind of get some clarity to those passages. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 6, then it says, And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And so here the command is given to take up the ark of the covenant and go. Before the ark of the covenant, those seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns. And there's also some prophetic language there. You can go to Revelation 8 9 in your own time and in your own study. And as opposed to seven priests, you'll find seven angels preparing themselves to sound. Go and study that out and see if you see any any comparison between Joshua chapter 6 and what's going to transpire in those events. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 8 it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets the ark and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. Now I started to wonder myself the, um, the picture that's taken place as far as, as God leading or us leading. Because remember the captain of the host of the Lord asked, are you with me? It wasn't a question of whether or not God was on our side or their side. God just simply said, well, are you on my side? And so often when we think about that, we'll find that scores of times in scriptures. And uh, my good friend, um, Pastor Travis Bradley, just preached a great message down at Liberty Baptist. You should check out later. He talked about how the 
God is always going before us into any scenario. And so we need not fear or doubt. He will go before us and shine a light into all scenarios and situations. And then I looked at this passage and I'm like, okay, then, then why are these priests and, the, and, the, uh, and, and those that are bearing the ark and the armed men, why are they all going before God? Isn't that kind of counter what you'd expect of the Lord and his leading of us? It sounds like they're leading, but no, that's not at all what took place. Essentially, because God had given them the command, and in giving them the command to go forth and to do these things, he's assured them that he has already gone before them in that same way. The word of God went before them when it said, See, I've given into thine hand all of this city, the king and the mighty man of valor. When the word of God said, you're going to compass the city, a promise made. All the men of war are going to go round about the city. You're going to do it six days. And then once you've fulfilled all of these things, the sound of the trumpet, shouting with a great shout, the wall falls. God's saying, look, I'm going before you because I promise this will be fulfilled in your obedience to follow after. So God sends the command. The people follow the command. And then God, just, just as, he, as he loves to do, let's just say keeps our six. Right? In military terms. Twelve o'clock's in front of me, six is over here, behind me. God in his in his ark, God in his trumpets, follow in behind the people and make sure he's watching our backs. He goes before us and behind us in everything we do. Commands before us, leads before us, and then makes sure that nobody sneaks up behind us. And that's important too, because if you were to go to Ephesians chapter six, you're gonna find the whole arm of God, and what are you gonna find? You're gonna find um, a helmet, you're going to find loins girt about with truth, you're going to find a breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you're going to find a shield of faith, where you're with, you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, you're going to find the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and you're going to find our, our enablement and our, our power that comes from prayer and supplications unto God, but what it doesn't mention is anything covering my back. <laughs> so the Christian is always going to be um, it, it, it tells me a bunch of things, just that, that passage alone. Is that, first of all, we don't have any defense on our back, so that's why it's good in a, in a battle situation like this, that God and his Ark of the Covenant are keeping our six and watching our backs. We also need to understand that the Christian warfare is not one that ever allows for retreat. If you're going to retreat, if you're going to turn your battle, your back to the enemy, you're going to leave yourself open and, and ready to be, to be shot in the back. Don't retreat always, marching on, marching on, right? For Christ, count everything but loss, moving forward, pressing on, going forward. There's no need for the Christian to retreat. If we retreat, we're actually in a, in a pretty vulnerable state. The other thing that I see here is even if we are marching forward, even if we are pressing on, doing the right thing, even if God's behind us keeping our six, the only other threat that we really have as believers is friendly fire. <laughs> And in my experience, this, is, this happens quite often. I, I, don't, I don't feel many attacks that come from the world, that come from unbelievers, that come from the enemies, right? Because I have the whole armor of God. I can stand in that. Stand, therefore, having your loins good about. Stand, therefore, having the shield of faith. Stand. I can stand against whatever the world's going to do, but too often it's Christians that are behind me that end up being the ones that pick me off, shoot me in the back, injure me, right? Hurt me harm me okay friendly fire as it were but that happens and god will certainly carry us through that as well so he's describing what will happen he says twice here and it sh or he says in verse five and it shall come to pass he says in verse eight and it came to pass as, as it was promised now we'll continue on down in verse nine and it says and the armed men went before the priest that blew with the trumpets and the rear reward came after the ark, the priests going on, blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then ye shall shout. So only in the day that you're bidden, only in the time when it is, it is, it is, it is commanded these people, they were to finally give their shout and that shout was to be one of of great victory i don't know necessarily know why joshua said you know what don't even make a noise don't even make a peep don't let any word proceed out of your mouth just do the marching and, and until you shout maybe he didn't want any misfires 
Maybe he didn't want somebody uttering something loud enough and everybody thinks it was a shout that they were supposed to do. He just he wanted to make sure that there was pure obedience. Maybe these were safeguards. And there's nothing wrong with safeguards. I'm reminded of one of the most most famous safeguards in the scriptures was um, was Eve. Some people think that Eve added to the word of God there in the garden, but I think she actually just had a safeguard given her by her husband. Because God sent forth the commandment, says, Ye shall not eat of it. And the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And when the serpent asked Eve... Yea, hath God said? She said, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I think that, that neither shall ye touch it wasn't her trying to corrupt the word of God and sneak in a verse here. I think Adam said, look, look, God told me, don't eat of that tree. And you know what? Just to be safe, don't even touch it. <laughs> don't even go near it. Don't even have any of that temptation upon you. That's just, that's just a safeguard. We ought to do that in our own lives. We know, we know that sin is here, and sometimes we like to just creep up as close to sin as we possibly can <laughs> before we actually commit it. Shouldn't we keep our distance a little bit? Think of adultery, for example, any of the married men or soon-to-be married men here, right? The Bible records, thou shalt not commit adultery, and that's, that's way over here, far from the Christian walk. But doesn't Jesus say, say to look upon a woman with lust? He hath committed adultery in her heart. And the more you look and the more you commit adultery with your heart, the closer you get to the actual sin and, and the more you, you fulfill those, those fantasies in your mind and those desires and the lust gets, gets fed and you're feeding the flesh and not the spirit, you're getting closer and closer to that sin. You're better off to, to, to not even, like the Bible says, not even touch it, not even look at it. You're better off to like Joshua did to the people. The Bible says that Joshua had commanded the people. And I actually don't find record of the Lord commanding the people. I think Joshua wisely as a leader set up some safeguards for his people because God said that when you shout with a great shout, the wall shall fall. But I only want that wall to fall after you've compassed six times and then on the seventh day, seven times you compass, then the ram's horn gets blown, then you shout and then God brings down the strongholds, right? He wanted that to take place in proper order. That was the command of God. And Joshua was like, you know what? Just to be safe. Verse 10, ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you. Then shall ye shout. A little bit of a safeguard there because Joshua wanted all of God's will to be fulfilled in due order and on time. And verse 11, it says, So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged at the camp. And so the first day, it looks like, was pretty successful. They went out, they marched around the whole city, came back to their camp, and it was over. I wonder what people were wondering after that. Like, is this really going to do anything? I know God has promised that, that Jericho's given into our hands, and I know he's all, but how is walking around, around this thing going to get anything done? is another good picture of the Christian life because God commands us and adjures us to, to walk, right? We talked last week, as ye have received the Lord, so walk ye in him. The Apostle Paul is always talking about walk with God. It's, it doesn't seem very, very um, you know, s strong of, a, of an action. It doesn't seem like you're really getting anything done. Just walk with God. That's all God wants from us, just to walk in obedience, walk in his commands, walk and do exactly what he said. It seems like God should expect more of us. Shouldn't we climb a wall? Shouldn't we knock? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we shoot at them? Shouldn't we be more, more active? Shouldn't we do more works? <laughs> no, God says, just walk with me. Just walk with me. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. It's just a walk with God. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. I'm just going to break into song up here because, because that's all God wants from us is just, just a walk with Christ. And so they did it that first day. In Joshua chapter 12, we continue on. He says, and Joshua rose early in the morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets and the armed men went before them. But the rear reward, that's simply what's behind you. That's the rear word, came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned 
into the camp, just in going for another walk with God. So they did six days. Now, if it didn't seem foolish to them on the first day, the second day, imagine six days of this. Get up in the morning, go for a stroll. <laughs> maybe it built up some anticipation, maybe some expectancy. Maybe as they did it, they were actually growing in faith because they saw, look, we're just out for a stroll. There's armed men up there, but not all of us are armed. We're all just going for a walk. We're not facing any attacks from the enemy. We're not facing any challenges or tribulation. In fact, the more we walk with God, I think it was getting easier for them. Think about it. The first time you trudge about a path, right, there's going to be rocks and things to stumble over, and it's going to be a little bit rough. Now, now think about maybe near your house. People sometimes, they lay paths, but sometimes they're just man-made, aren't they? You walk a path through the woods enough times, and eventually those shrubs that were whipping you in the face and those, those logs that were getting you in, in the way, those, those troubles that you encounter as you walk that path, suddenly they're gone. You, you've cleared a path. It, it's dirt. It's packed down. It's easier. Not only did they have an easier stroll around there because of everything being cleared and packed down, but they also knew what to do. They'd already been that way before. They've already seen the sights before. It's just getting easier and easier the more they walk with God. But it all builds up to the biggest trial yet. Every day they've done the one walk. Let's say it's one mile, one mile, one mile. You've prepared yourself to do one mile's walk and then on the seventh day, you got to do seven miles. It's like, whoa, now, I, now all the challenges that I face, all the work that I've done in preparing myself, I really get to put it to the test. I get to do the long walk seven times more than I had done previous. Walk this path with God. And I think that's how God works with us. In, in my experience in, in training for, um, for, for physical activities of the endurance type, if my goal is to do seven, doing one at a time, it will get me a little bit prepared. It'll it'll get some endurance. It'll, but but to get to seven after just preparing yourself with ones, that, that's a big leap to make. That that's exponential. That's that's a challenge. And I think all that lends itself to the truth that we keep discovering more and more and more and more is that is that God is the one that is going to bring us through. Okay. So I'm able in my own strength, and these people were able in their own strength to get that one lap done. But when they're brought to the challenge where they need to do seven, well, maybe it's a little bit difficult. Think about it. Doing two is twice as much work, right? Doing four, four times, as, doing seven is seven times more work. Just think about weightlifting. <laughs> if you can lift 50 pounds... Does that mean you do that, you know, once a day, that you can on the seventh day lift 350 pounds? <laughs> no, you can't do it in the power of your own flesh. God can, though. And our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's his great might that is ultimately going to pull down the stronghold. And he brought them through this. Not only that, I believe he encouraged them through this because as they walked about, perhaps more tired than they'd ever been before and more worn out and challenged than they've ever been before, it didn't seem to matter because by the time you get to verse 15, it says, and it came to pass on the seventh day, they rose up early about the dawning of the day. They didn't mention the time that they got up any of the other days, but they got up early. They were zealous. They were excited. They were ready to go. They got up early on that seventh day about the dawning of the day. And it continues, encompass the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the land. Not only had they pushed through the exhaustion, not only had they labored longer into the day, which the heat probably got a hold of them a little bit more. They were more worn out. It was the end of a week. They had, they had gotten to this point. They were, they were excited. They got up early. But at the end of it all, they were still able to muster enough energy to shout and to rejoice and to have, and to have great joy over the triumph that God was about to do as he fulfills the promise that he made, that wall shall fall down flat. He proclaims through his prophet, servant, leader Joshua, the Lord hath given you the city. 
In verse 17 it says, And the city shall be accursed, accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And not only that, that hiding of the messengers that, she, that were sent was her justifying the fact that she was saved. So she was saved out of it because she was a believer and just like all these did, had simply done what God had told her to do. She believed God, it was imputed unto righteousness, and she showed her belief by obeying the word of the Lord. But you see complete decimation and destruction come upon the city that would do the opposite. God's people here are only succeeding. Even people that lived in that city that have believed God and obeyed him are now succeeding. But all those otherwise, the Bible is recording, are accursed. Verse 18, it says, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. That city is accursed. Those people are accursed. The possessions are accursed. All of it is accursed. You who believe on Jesus, you who are saved, keep yourself from the accursed thing. Lest ye make yourself accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed to trouble it. Now, this is an interesting fact of reality is that something that is unclean does not make something else clean. Right? If I touch something filthy, I am filthy. But then I can't take something that is clean and touch it on the filthy thing and expect that the clean will rub off. That's not how it works. If I just do that, if I was to touch something, oh, that's filthy, and then take something, here's an example, this is clean and rub it on it, now all of it's unclean, right? The dirt just keeps transferring over. You actually need something like soap, which actually forms a bubble around the dirt and takes it another way. <laughs> We need, by example, our Lord, who's like our soap, that takes our dirt, wraps himself around it, and removes it, as far as the east is from the west. But here Joshua, again, just gives a safeguard. He's like, look, look, just keep yourselves from the accursed thing. When you go in, keep yourselves from it, lest you touch the accursed thing, and lest that accursed thing make you an accursed, and then you coming into the camp, make the camp accursed, and the whole camp of Israel becomes accursed and is troubled as a result of your decision. And this is what happens. It can happen in a church. One in the body gets infected with accursedness and they come in and that little leaven leavens the whole lump gradually. Okay? This is how, this is how sin works. This is how uncleanness works. Joshua continues on in verse 19. And it says, And all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. The interesting thing about gold, silver, brass, iron is that they can be purified by sending them through fire. And this is why God said it's okay for you to bring all of these into the treasury of the Lord. And that's a pretty good bonus for Israel who had been, who had been more or less hunter-gatherers. At this point, they were basically just bringing in manna to eat. They probably didn't have a whole bunch of substance or wealth and did not really understand how they were going to provide for themselves going forward. But the very first city that they sack provides for them in the treasury of God to make provision for the camp of God, silver and gold and brass and iron and all of these things come into their possession. So that's a great, great, right off the bat, kickstart to the nation of Israel in their new promised land. Verse 20, it says, So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So all the defenses of the that city, the last bit of hope, if they had any at all, with their melted hearts, fell down with that wall, and Israel simply went up straight into that city and took over it. Verse 21 continues and tells us, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. So the unclean beasts, of course, they had no use for them. And so they were destroyed and removed, right? And then, um, not clean Levitically, but they're, they're unclean as a result of being a part of this city. And the Bible says that 
utter destruction fell upon man, woman, young, and old at this time. And people often find great fault with the scriptures here recording the, um, the utter destruction of people groups here. But I'm not going to go there. I plan to, but I'm running out of time. Let's not forget that back in Leviticus 20, you can go there, verse 22 in the end of that chapter, talks about how the people of these lands had committed all these sins. And before that, in Leviticus chapter 20, in Leviticus chapter 18, we don't need to reiterate it. We talked about it in our Put to Death series. There was all sorts of, of incestual behavior, sexual immorality, murders, thefts, un- just, just the most depraved things that would cause people nowadays with any type of, type of conscience to grow sick to the stomach these sins were taking place, and most of these sins, if not the, the vast majority, I would say, of them, were associated with the death penalty. That was, that was God's command for his own nation, and so this is God's command as he enters into the land. The Bible says that they did all of these things, bestiality, all of these things, uh, incest, all of these things, um, homosexuality, all of these filthy, depraved sins they had taken place in and so god has israel play out exactly what his justice demands when these sins take place in verse 22 it says but joshua and and if you have a problem with that you got to take it up with god i didn't write the book (laughs) but joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And so they were brought out, as was promised. I think they stayed potentially, it was out of the camp for a for a perceived amount of time. Um <clears throat> just because of, of the, the debate about whether or not they were clean or unclean, there would be certain things that would have to take place, I think, ritually in order for them to be fully led into the camp. Uh, one thing would be circumcision among the men. But regardless, they brought them, the spies brought all that family out and, put, and, and for a short term left them without the camp, though they were now without the city and therefore saved from certain destruction. Verse 24, this is the destruction that followed. They burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels and the brass and the iron they put into the treasury of the Lord. And that was really convenient that they just burnt the whole city. And basically whatever's left is what they brought into the treasury. Because that's also what happens to our works after we're saved. Wood, hay, stubble, oxes, asses, you know, uh, clothing. All these things were in the city. Right? There was also gold, silver, precious stones. When all of it was lit on fire, the only thing that was left was what was received into the kingdom. And the only thing that's left once this whole life is done and judged is going to be your gold, silver, and precious stones. And that will be received into your personal treasury. Your, your, your good works shall be manifest in that day as those um, symbolic gold, silver, and precious stones that have gone through that fire of purification. Verse 25, it says, And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household, and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent out to spy Jericho. So Rahab was obviously welcomed in her and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. And I think we can extend that out to be not only unto this day, once this book was finally penned down and finalized, but unto this day, she's still a part of spiritual Israel. She still dwells in Israel according to the Spirit. Continue on in verse 26, and it says, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up, And buildeth this city Jericho. I mean, complete and total devastation and destruction to the point where Joshua proclaims this cursing on anyone who would even try to rebuild this city. He says, he shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn. There's a promise. 
And in his youngest shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. So that verse 26, that actually was fulfilled. You can write it down. Go look it up in your own time. 1 Kings 16.34. 1 Kings 16.34. Actually reverse to this exact event where a man went and builded that city Jericho, and he indeed laid the foundation in his firstborn and in the youngest of his sons, he set up the gates of it. And so we see here, Joshua's fame continues to be noised about. He begins, to, he begins to be heard in all the country as if he wasn't already at that point. As the wonderful leader that he is, sure, but I think more prominently as, as the faithful man following the living God, who worketh all things by the counsel of his own will, and who promised that this land would be Joshua's and his people's if they would just trust him and walk with him. 